so welcome everyone. This is the Open Research Institute's uh, meetup and we talk about FPGA work, field programmable gate array work on our projects. And what we do at this meeting is we talk about what we've done over the past week, uh, what we have planned over the next week, uh, if we need any resources and if we have any particular roadblocks. Um, we share share technical reports and uh, talk about plans for demonstrations, things like that. Uh, so uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'm going to hand it over to, um, to Matthew to speak to uh, Opulent Voice and the FPGA work there um, to, to kick us off. All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. So we, I think we've made some good progress. Uh, um, in the last couple of weeks, we have digital loopback working within the modem uh, on the Pluto platform. And a couple little things there that, that aren't still quite making sense, but um, we are seeing error-free operation and we can, you know, if we invert, invert the data stream, you know, we get about a 50% error rate. So um, regardless of the F2 Costa Sloop uh, acting a little oddly, um, you know, it is clearly demodulating error-free. So um, really pleased about that. <laughs> feels like it took way too long to get there. Um, and the main, uh, I, you know, there wasn't really any RTL changes to do that. It was just meaning finding a good set of coefficients and then realizing that the um, PRBS um, polynomial was was a little bit incorrect. So um, although I'm not sure if that really was the problem, but between those two, we, we did get a stable um, digital loopback working. So I think from here, from as far as the modem's concerned, oh, I did make some updates then uh, to improve maybe, hopefully, um, some of the PRBS operations. One is that there's a auto sync, so you can configure a threshold number of errors. And if that number of errors is reached, the PRBS will resync on its own without a command. Um, and then the other thing is uh, it's a build time uh, configuration uh, that you can either select the, you know, to synchronize, to insert an error, to clear the counters. You can either write a one and then later write a zero uh, into the configuration register, or with this change, you can just toggle the relevant bit in the configuration register. Um, and the the point of the toggling the bit versus writing one and zero is it removes any timing concerns. Um, we have a low bit rate, you know, in the in the processor, it's very fast. We might write the one and zero uh, faster than than the PRBS would react to it. So. Uh, by toggling, then we we remove any timing dependencies in terms of inserting those commands. Um, and so that's, like I said, a build time configuration through a generic. We could make it um, a runtime configuration if we wanted. Um, I just, I don't think we'd want to, you know, go back and forth on the runtime with that. So um, then moving forward, um, I don't have a lot of specific plans at the moment. I would like to understand why the um, F2 Costa Sloop is acting the way that it does. I do see it in simulation acting similarly, I think with certain uh, um, PI gains. Um, but my current simulation with the, with the PI gains that I'm using, it acts as I would expect, but then it still is acting this kind of odd way in the in the Pluto where it's the, the loop accumulator is um, looks like it's stuck. It, it's not moving where you would expect it to be moving around zero since we don't have any frequency offsets. And um, in, in the, the F1 Costa Sloop is acting the way you would expect. It kind of goes you know positive for a little while, goes negative for a little while, positive and, and goes back and forth. And as the loop stabilized, you know, but um, delta between the positive and negative values gets fairly small, relatively small. But the the F2 loop is just stuck at this negative value um, indefinitely, and I never see it move. I wasn't sure if it was like a readback issue potentially, but 
you know, I, I can get it to move if I set a frequency offset or change the gains. Um, so, I mean, it, it is reading back correctly. So it's, it's just an odd thing. It's the same exact same code between the F1 and 2. Um, so I don't understand why it would be behaving this way. So um, a couple of thoughts would be in terms of, of looking more deeply at this is if we can get the receive working, uh, the receive DMA working, we could potentially use the take the unused bits of the um, receive path and put some data in them. So like it'd be a kind of an ILA or a, a poor man's ILA where we could take, you know, stream data from the, um, from the gains, even samples potentially uh, through that interface so that we can collect them and, and kind of take a look at them um, in a, in a non-real time environment, but we can at least see what, what, the loop might be doing um, and how it might be processing the incoming data in a way that we can't see currently. Um, so that, that would be kind of either that or actually put an ILA into the into the FPGA, assuming we have resources and that somebody has a dongle. I, I don't, but I should probably order one. Um, and do we is I do we know? I hadn't looked yet. If does the um, I assume the Pluto has a JTAG port that we can attach a Xilinx dongle to. Okay, so that would so that would be another way to pr proceed. Would be um, to actually put in an ILA and and look at the at the loop operation that way. But overall, I'm 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 really encouraged because this tells me that the modem's working as we expect. Other than the coast one, the F2 Costas loop, the um, you know it's matching the simulation results and and if you toggle bits a certain way, we get expected results. So everything is, um, I'm, I'm real pleased with, with what it's looking like right now. I think uh, that's all I had. Well, thank you. That's tons. Um, so yes, the um, the loop back uh, after, after we sorted out some issues with how to write the registers and the order and also some, some timing, um, we did have to insert some delays to, to let things settle, which is, this is ordinary. Um, and we discovered uh, at least a, a sort of a, at a, at a larger um, a resolution, you know, in terms of milliseconds, like how long does it really take for things to settle? Um, and so when I get some time, I'll, I'll try to, to narrow that down and to, to figure out exactly how long it took for, <laughs> you know, when we write some of the control registers, and then, then we see what we're expecting with the PRBS and with the loop back or pseudo random binary sequence in the loop back. So and, all and, of that. And, oh, sorry, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, you know, with the toggling mode, which I've built, but I haven't tested yet on the Pluto platform, um, you know, it should take out some of those dependencies on the timing. And what was the other thing I was going to say? Oh, it ran out of my head. So <laughs> I'll, I'll I, have, to it, I, I, I have only empathy. <laughs> yeah. So exactly right. So, so, um, when we when we kind of grapple with these issues, we then see that there's um, there's things that we can do to kind of make it easier on ourselves, and uh, you know, setting and clearing certain register bits. It's like, oh, okay, so you know, if we can reduce it down to just a toggle or the auto sync, yeah, that's that's going to be super useful, and that will actually become part of the the landscape. This will become part of the design that it will auto sync on its own. So, for those of you following along, the synchronization um, in in this in this sense uh, is is to kind of like synchronize the pattern that we're sending with the pattern that we're receiving to reduce any of the uh, confusion or uncertainty. So if, if you want to think about it, the auto sync in this particular case is to, to control the system, to reduce uncertainty and to ensure that we are in the right place in the sequence and we can see it working. So anything that kind of automates a process that would otherwise be, uh, oh, go to a register, make sure you clear a bit, make sure you set a bet and then clear it again, you know, and, and also do it with the correct timing, anything that we can and automate is going to help us tremendously in the long run and make it a, a much more reliable design. So yeah, we saw this stuff clear up and um, Goose was neat because what we've done is we've kind of moved from uh, debugging things. Well, there was there is plenty more to do at the RTL level, the HDL level, 
uh, the logic level. But in order to, you know, we, we've now we're now looking at at now ordering the design around. And so a lot of what we're doing um, over the past few weeks and what we'll be doing over the next few weeks is done at the processor side. So we're writing C code to, you know, or and you know, there's several ways to to kind of approach this. Uh, so when I say C code, that's that's the part that I'm writing as a very simple and rudimentary uh, live IIO uh, C code application in Vitus, really, and not even Vitus. I'm just writing in um, in Nano at this point, and then comp cross compiling and then sending it to the Pluto. So this is pretty simplistic and very rudimentary. I'm just using the IIO libraries to try to reproduce a streaming example. And so the streaming example from analog devices is just using live IIO calls to get the Pluto to stream uh, samples. And that you know example code that you get from analog devices just says, here you go, here's your I and Q. Um, we're going to just make up some numbers. And for whatever reason, they chose to send zeros. So we usually just change that to actually have a value because sending zeros as IQ to us doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Like you want to be able to see something else come out of it and to be able to, ch to do some change, some dynamic changes over time. Uh, Paul's written a, a really neat wiggle uh, demo that what it does is it makes a number of spikes uh, uh, in the spectrum, and they all move around in a particular pattern. It's very lovely. And you instantly see that, yeah, what I'm telling it to do uh, shows up. So with all these tools, we now moved into sort of the processor side to kind of test things out. Um, and so that's my roadblock right now is that the, uh, the buffers, the kernel buffers, uh, which are underneath the transmit and receive buffers in LiveIO, I'm getting timeouts on both receive and transmit. So this is undoubtedly because I don't have the right uh, sample rates, the right clocks set up in the in the code. Um, but the fact that we're there, that we're at this point, it means that we are very far along and that a over the air loopback is um, well within reach. Um, so what I did to try to address the the timeouts with the with the setup of the code that I have, which looked like it might be reasonable, uh, was to change the number of buffers. You can have anywhere from one to 64 uh, for the Pluto. I don't think you can have, the 64 will cause it to uh, cause another error, um, you know, but you can have 16. So 16, four and one didn't help the problem. Changing the timeout to as long as 10 seconds uh, before it checked for a timeout didn't help. So the problem definitely is, uh, something more straightforward. Uh, so something in the the way that the sample rates and the uh, the filters and and things are the radio is set up. I have a thought there. Um, that was a good time. That we left the interpolator in, I believe. I don't know how it's being configured, but the the MSK modem itself is initially in the at the moment configured for a, a sixty one point four megahertz sample rate. So if the interpolator is is turned on and is doing any interpolation I, I could see the sample rates being all messed up yeah okay yeah we're we will definitely look at that i know that the interpolator is used in some of our other projects on the pluto it's not as far as i know it should not be active but you know uh it doesn't work until it's tested and we need to make sure that we know what the default behavior is uh, so plenty to do over the next week, but we are, we're so, we're really close and, and uh, the, you know, even, and we were learning how to uh, do things like, like control the timeouts, control the buffer size, you know, we see all of these things. Um, if you want to look yourself, then, then on uh, anybody following along, it's all on Slack. So uh, the code itself, the results uh, from the, the, the console and also uh, Paul, captured uh, spectrum. So we're not seeing the spectrum that we expect yet, but the fact that we saw a spectrum when we went from the loop back to uh, what we call normal operations, meaning, hey, the radio should be getting the samples, uh, we see a signal and that is really good. And it's where we expect. It's not the size that we expect and it's uh, you know, it's not the bandwidth we expect, but again, uh, the sample rates are wrong. I was sort of hoping that we would see something based on the symbol rate that we picked, but 
as as you mentioned, um, if we have things like interpolators <laughs> in there, uh, if we have other other things that are that are interfering, that could easily explain it. So good, lots of good news, and uh, uh, plenty plenty of folks uh, uh, working hard. Um, yeah, no, this next week should be should be great. All right, any anything else, Matthew? Anything I missed? Um, no, no, I I don't think so. I think uh, I, well, I was just going to mention the one thing. Um, when I was doing my testing, I wasn't seeing the timing issues that you were seeing, but I was using the the MQTT interface that Everest had put together, uh, which is operating much more slowly than your C code. So, um, so that I guess that kind of fits with the um the timing issues that we were that you had mentioned. Yeah, when when you mentioned that, it, when I inserted some. Uh, more delay than I thought was needed, but not very much more, maybe by a factor of 10. Um, you know, so we're talking like 60, I think 60 milliseconds maybe, or might be in the microsecond range. But, but yeah, when I inserted the delay, then I started matching what you had observed. So I think it was it was just a question of uh, pestering the the registers too quickly and and not giving enough time for, for things to, to settle down. Um, and so, so yeah, I think we're we're now we're now lined up with uh, what we put in is what we we are seeing, and uh, we'll we'll keep at it. All right. So go ahead, Ken, and tell us uh, tell us where you're at and and what you need. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, you sound good. Okay, sorry, I had trouble getting it off mute. Yeah, um, pretty much the same state as we left it uh, on Friday, and. Uh, action item is to uh, see if we can add the delay. I, I think the, the hope and expectation is that the uh, the errors that we're seeing are, are kind of an artifact of initialization and they should go away uh, if we come back and check the loops later. And that, you know, the ultimately the report does seem to say that everything is fine as it exits the uh, initialization. So um, yeah, it's just modifying this eco to add a delay and, and testing that, see if I've not had a chance to do that yet and uh, make as much time as I can here. I've, I've taken on new roles and responsibilities, but this is still an area that I want to make contributions. And I appreciate everything that uh, helped me along the way here. I, I think it's been a good training ground for my, my new role and um, looking looking forward to still, still contributing. So uh, as far as time, yeah, I can try and make this 10 o'clock slide. I may not be able to all the time, but uh, that's... Uh, that's where we are. So, thanks. No, you're you're very welcome. And we can also do um, maybe every other Tuesday, every other Friday. We could try to go back and forth. Um, since since you might be able to make make every other Friday, it sounds like. Um, and yeah, you're you're talking about the okay. So when you're for those of you uh, following along or, or new, um, so what what Ken's uh, kind of talking about is an error message that looks like it it errors out. So this is to build uh, the what we call the no OS or no operating system um, a version of an implementation for the, the receiver on the spacecraft side. And so so Ken's implemented uh, polyphase channelizer. Um, this is code originally from Theseus Cores, a project that does uh, open source uh, multi-rate work, uh, FPGA work. And, and a lot of work has gone into this and then integrating that uh, sort of standalone code base into um, something like the the ADRV 9009 which is on the ZC706 in our lab it's a it's a big job um, there's a lot of moving parts to this and there's a couple of different ways to do it so there's a multi-pronged approach and and what Ken's talking about here is the no OS version and some snags along the way so you get through the make process of integrating your custom IP into the reference design onto you know, <laughs> this uh, this capable hardware, and it looks like it just says goodbye, you know, um, and errors out in in what looks like uh, some of the the JSD 204B um, you know guts. Uh, that's where it looks like it's it's uh, it's quitting. 
the advice from the uh, public forum, which is where we all get kind of pointed to when we have problems, analog devices kind of points you to engineer zone. Advice from engineer zone is that this really isn't a problem. It looks like an error, but everything worked out okay looking at your results uh, and to disregard the error message, which is kind of hard when it just kind of ends and it's not really clear if it's uh, built or not. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and take the advice from engineer zone at face value and proceed and uh, and include a delay to try to this this may clear it up uh, and make it make it look like um, make everything look fine. So that's the next step there. This work needs to to work. So this design has to work in order for the um, the opulent voice uplink protocol to to be successfully received so that we can get our end-to-end -end demo from ground up to space and then uh, essentially retransmitted um, as DVBS2 frames on the downlink. So the the goal uh, long term is to have an end-to-end -end demo, the whole thing working. So the things that we're talking about today are two really big chunks of a, a ambitious program. So thank you very much, Ken. And anything that I can do to help, uh, count me in. And thank you very much for uh, for the report and and the relative. I always call it good news. You know that the error is not a showstopper. It's a it's just a, a, a flare up. It sounds like. So thank you. All right, Paul, you have the floor. Okay, uh, not much to report since since Friday. Um, sounds like you already covered all the stuff that I was working with you on. Um, I don't have any of that. Yeah, thank you very much for your help. The lab seems to be working well. I know it's still slower than we like, um, and that we still need to to integrate the uh, new hardware and to test it. Yeah, thanks for all the help this past week. It's been been good. Um, and thank you very much for the detailed walkthrough uh, comparison of the C code for me and the compared to uh, your earlier uh, streaming code efforts and uh, the things that you've done you've done for for opulent voice uh, for the uh, for the general purpose processor so the code that you've independently developed uh, being able to to step through and compare it uh, to the the code I'm using to test the the uh, FPGA uh, version that was super helpful so thank you yeah one difference but in the way I was testing that versus what we've been doing in the last few days is that um, I was not running on the Pluto microprocessor. I was using the Pluto as a IO um, server over the, over the ethernet. So I'm running on uh, raspberry Pi in my case. We could try that and see if it's different. Um, I don't know whether, why it would be, but you never know. Well, you know what ruling anything out is, is of value, so I'm game, and I'll, uh, I'll I'll bug you later today. Then, thank you. Thank you. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, I think that that concludes all of our formal reports for the day. And <laughs>